Yeah, in this uh, module we have been looking at uh, the characterization techniques and um, uh, the way we have faced uh, understanding the characterization techniques and how we can learn from these uh, uh, instruments may, namely diffraction, spectroscopy, microscopy methods. Um, we instead of learning uh, each and every technique it is better that we look at some case studies and then we will understand um, in a comprehensive way how we can use these techniques to uh, elucidate structure and to correlate that with the property that we are seeing. So, in today's uh, lecture we are going to look at a case study on uh, zinc oxide which is doped with manganese. Uh, in the last uh, 7 years this particular uh, study has brought in lot of research focus mainly because it addressed one of the very sensitive area called spintronics. Um, in fact, uh, this lecture is aimed to show how simple techniques can be used to understand whether we are really hitting the bullseye, because it is possible that we can prepare several compounds, but yet not knowing that we have not achieved the uh, final product. So, in this connection we will try to see how all the characterization techniques can be combined to get a comprehensive idea of a single system that is manganese doped zinc oxide. <coughs> Why it is important? Because it shows room temperature ferromagnetism as a result it finds a potential spintronic uh, application. But what I am going to tell is the story that evolved around this one single system and how cautious as a chemist or a physicist or as technologists we need to be um, and how this characterization techniques can come handy to understand. This is a simple cartoon uh, we can try to visualize uh, which is typical of zinc oxide wood side structure and uh, if we try to incorporate a magnetic ion with a spin or it could be any other ion which can induce a ferromagnetism. How this ferromagnetic core can influence zinc oxide? Now notably manganese is not a ferromagnetic compound. So, we are going to look at the origin of magnetic property in zinc oxide using a doping of a non magnetic ion. So, it is a much simpler uh, issue how to elucidate the ferromagnetic component that is present in zinc oxide because both zinc oxide as well as manganese that is doped there M and 2 plus both are not magnetic. So, it is much easier for us to evaluate what is really going on there. <coughs> now, uh, what is the big hype about manganese zinc oxide? Uh, since it is a case study I want to single out some of the importance of this before we go into a in depth analysis. Manganese zin doped zinc oxide has gained more intense research activity uh, in the past few years as I told you and uh, because zinc oxide is optically very very potential candidate for photonic applications any doping would affect the photonic uh, properties or optical properties especially if you dope it with a high band gap material that is MNO. So, if it is manganese which is going as MN2 plus into zinc site then you would see a clear shift in the optical property. Manganese also being ferro anti ferromagnetic metal the doping of MNO we can call this MNO in zinc oxide lattice should not necessarily show a ferromagnetic property it should not show. So, it makes the case much more interesting for us to understand where is the magnetism coming from. But what is peculiar of this manganese doped zinc oxide is you observe this at room temperature any compound which gives trace of impurities is supposed to show T c below room temperature, but manganese doped zinc oxide shows 
above room temperature that makes it much more interesting to know where this comes from. So, uh, the question of origin of room temperature ferromagnetism after 7 years of uh, effort is still not a resolved picture although plenty of indication is there about what exactly is happening. The potential advantage of uh, such spintronic materials is that you can make a spintronic device and that will be higher speed greater efficiency and better stability at a reduced power consumption. This is the implication as far as uh, spintronic application is concerned. So, with this in perception uh, let us see uh, where it all started how the story evolved. Uh, reports started coming as early as uh, 2003 with a breaking news in nature materials. This is actually a Swedish group uh, Professor K. V. Rao's group which published that manganese 2 plus when it is substituted in zinc 2 plus sites that is ZNO it shows room temperature ferromagnetism and uh, soon there was a report saying that the observed magnetism is not coming from manganese substituted in ZNO, but it is due to a metastable phase such as M n 2 minus x Z n x O 3 minus delta. This is nothing but M n 2 O 3 seemingly substituted with Z n 2 plus. So, there are several related papers which has come out which further shows the implication of the impurity phases which can cause magnetic signal. Due to segregated magnetic clusters this magnetic signature can come which was published in PRL in 2004 and uh, someone elucidated that there is presence of M n 3 plus and M n 4 plus which leads to a double exchange mediated um, ferromagnetism which appeared uh, uh, as late as 2007 and uh, defect structures were also contributing to the magnetic properties which was uh, told in 2005. So, as you see here historically this is the first paper and the second paper that comes along is this. Now, in the next few slides I will try to show you um, what were the contradictions and how the analytical um, instruments or uh, techniques that were used help us understand what really was going. This lecture is intended not to put any research uh, group in uh, darker side, but just to highlight based on the published reports how careful we need to be when we are preparing oxides and we may, when we make assertion that there is a magnetism in a particular compound. So, with this uh, as a disclaimer I would like to show some of the results. Uh, now, in Nature Materials 2003 as you know um, Professor Rao's group uh, published this article saying ferromagnetism is above room temperature both in bulk and transparent films which brought a curiosity among the scientific community because sometimes you can see ferromagnetism in bulk, but it need not actually transpose in the thin film form or sometimes it may be there in thin film it need not be in bulk, but when it goes hand uh, hand in hand and when you see that the bulk pellets as well as transparent films of very thin order they show this sort of ferromagnetism then you are bound to believe that something is really happening. So, what was the abstract? The abstract said the search for ferromagnetism above room temperature in dilute magnetic semiconductors has been intense uh, activity in recent years. We report the first observations of ferromagnetism above room temperature for dilute that is less than 4 atom percent manganese doped zinc oxide. The manganese is found to carry an average magnetic moment of 0.16 mu b per, at, per ion <coughs> and what did they say? They also said the unique feature of our sample preparation is that it is a low temperature processing all the samples were prepared below 700 and uh, they they could uh, do this 
uh, pronouncing that there is a room temperature effect and they also said that this could be the new spintronic uh, <coughs> device for magnetic uh, uh, magnet optic uh, uh, devices. Now, soon after this report there was a, a counter argument from this group. Um, this is uh, Professor Venkatesan's group in University of Maryland at College Park and they came with another paper in the same magazine that is nature materials in a span of just 9 months where they said on the origin of high temperature ferromagnetism in the low temperature processed manganese oxide compound. I would not like to uh, read through the whole thing, but all I would like to pinpoint is direct low temperature thin film uh, deposition shows ferromagnetism at low zinc concentration and for an optimum um, oxygen growth pressure our results strongly suggest that the observed ferromagnetic phase is oxygen vacancy stabilize m n 2 minus x z n x o 3 minus delta. If I have to sum up in the first place what exactly their finding was this is the abstract that they showed and we will just see through few uh, slides to see how they progressively elucidated this which will be of fundamental uh, importance for our understanding about how to use these techniques uh, and how handy it can be. <coughs> Now, uh, this is the 2 percent manganese doped zinc oxide if you measure you will see a, a clear ferromagnetic loop and that magnetic loop is at 300 K. Now, if you look at this ferromagnetic loop as clear as this one would blindly say I have a magnetic material and carefully if you try to run M versus T m versus t you see here there is a ferromagnetic transition down to 1000 Kelvin that means T c is somewhere around 700 above 700 uh, degree centigrade. So, because it is uh, showing a T c above 700 degree centigrade you can be sure that at room temperature it has to be a room temperature ferromagnetic. So, there is nothing wrong <coughs> with this compound but we need to understand whether it is clearly a dilute magnetic semiconductor or not. So, what this group did they took both zinc oxide plus 2 percent MnO2 that is doped then mix it together and try to do a TG analysis. This is what they have to say to clarify the nature of interdiffusion reactions between MnO2 and zinc oxide powders as a function of temperature we used thermogravimetric analysis. Thermogravimetry is not a very very astounding or a very costly instrument it is affordable and almost every lab or analytical uh, centers would have it. But look at the way that the group has resorted to use a simple technique not much involved, but to elucidate some uh, primary features out of it. What did they do they just took this mixture of 2 percent MnO2 and then did the um, uh, uh, thermogravimetric analysis and also they took just MnO2 which is the starting material and do the thermogravimetric analysis in air. So, if you try to <coughs> heat MnO2 you can see this uh, red graph which clearly shows two plateau. First there is no change no loss of oxygen up to nearly 700 k and beyond 760 k you see a sharp fall and all these horizontal lines that you are seeing here is the calculated values for different composition of manganese namely M n 2 O 3 or M n 3 O 4 or M n O. These are the components that can come if you take M n O 2 and heat it in air. So, if M n 2 O 3 is forming then this should be in the first plateau, if M n 3 O 4 is forming this should be in this plateau. So, look at this there is some similarity between the 2 percent manganese oxide doped zinc oxide versus the standard M n O 2. What is happening you see the same sort of a fall and the first plateau is actually resembling that of M n 2 O 3 and then there is another plateau 
which is similar to MN 3 O 4. So, you are almost getting a similar feature that of uh, MnO 2 in uh, zinc oxide, but only thing the formation of MN 3 O 4 here is above 1000 Kelvin whereas, that region is actually more favored even at low temperature as low as say 980. So, there is a considerable shift in the formation of the second plateau that is MN 3 O 4. Similarly, you can see the MN 2 O 3 formation seems to be happening much below the standard. So, there could be some uh, thing that we can uh, pick up as it is that in the presence of ZNO the formation of both MN 2 O 3 and MN 3 O 4 are favored at much lower temperature. This is the first um, lesson that we can take. Another thing that <coughs> the MN 2 O 3, MN 3 O 4 are still present in 2 percent MnO 2 doped zinc oxide. Therefore, there is a clue that probably manganese is not exactly getting doped even at 700-900 K, it is still remaining as a phase of MN 3 O 4 or MN 2 O 3. Okay. Now, we can resort to the bulk uh, x-ray pattern. So, these are the bulk x-ray patterns, this is for zinc oxide which shows the hexagonal structure and this is characterized by three intense peaks, uh, one around 35, one around 47 uh, and one around 57. You see these three peaks and suppose you are going to take 2 percent of MnO 2 and you are going to mix it with the, this ZnO, you would see for the unsintered sample there are some signatures here which is not present in the um, pure ZnO. So, for example, this feature and these are some of the features that are coming only if you physically mix MnO 2 with ZnO. So, this is the uh, feature. Number 2, if you start sintering this compound below 700 K, you see still th there are reflections of MnO 2 here. There is one reflection of MnO 2 here, there is a reflection of MnO 2 here, there is another one here, there is another. In other words, even at 700 K, you do not seem to see this MnO 2 signature vanishing. Now, why this was missed out? mainly because the earlier group they studied the x-ray with a linear intensity scale, but what we are showing here is the log intensity. When you try to plot the log intensity versus 2 theta value, you always see all the impurities coming up which are more pronounced. Therefore, as a thumb rule when we try to work with uh, polycrystalline samples or bulk samples or even with thin film samples always it is a cardinal rule to look at the log intensity plot of x-ray because log intensity plot will bring this sort of small features to prominence mainly because relative to the intense peak of ZNO in linear intensity plot you would certainly miss out on these signatures and this was the first clue that made the other group to believe that probably manganese is not getting doped in the ZNO lattice. So, this is very crucial. Uh, the first message that we should take as we uh, go through a set of uh, data is that never look at the x-ray pattern without taking a log intensity plot on the y axis. So, if you get a log intensity plot and then you do not see any impurity feature, you can satisfy yourself saying that there is no secondary phase which is causing any influence on the uh, physical property that you are studying. So, this is one of the message that we can take. <coughs> now, um, this same group went about trying to el uh, elucidate if there is any uh, way that they can clearly prove that this is not manganese doping, but any other impurity phase. How did they do this? Uh, they resorted now not to bulk compound, but to making thin films and what sort of thin films you can make? Take C axis oriented um, Yale 2 O 3, which is also called sapphire. Sapphire is titania or iron doped alumina, 
which can be easily grown as a single crystal material. So, you try to take a single crystal of uh, Al 2 O 3 and then if we try to put uh, zinc oxide, <coughs> if you try to put zinc oxide up to 700 angstrom and then over the zinc oxide you can try to put manganese oxide. So, how does it go? It is almost like as depicted here you first uh, take the alumina peak that is your sapphire substrate and then epitaxially grow this much of uh, zinc oxide and after that you try to grow Mn 3 O 4 layer which is marked in the uh, with the green circles. So, this is the film that is grown it is called a bilayer deposition just to understand what is really happening as you try to anneal the substance. So, these uh, films are actually grown at higher temperature meaning uh, below 700 K uh, below the transition point. So, what is the message that we can take as you see here you have an intense peak uh, for alumina somewhere here, but along with that you also have the zinc oxide peak here and one would also observe even for 2 percent doped manganese oxide doped 1 you can clearly see in thin sorry the, this is not Mn 3 O 4. So, over and above zinc oxide if we try to put Mn 3 O 4 layer then you can see these signals coming here these are corresponding to Mn 3 O 4 and if you try to heat the whole film that is ZnO Mn O 4 uh, Mn 3 O 4 by layer then you can see here that the annealed one and the unannealed uh, film both are showing the phases for zinc oxide and Mn 3 O 4. Okay. But what you see here in the inset is there is a slight shift in the peak value for the ZnO peak and there is a slight shift in the peak value for Mn 3 O 4 which means something has happened at the interface you are still seeing the ZnO phase peak you are still seeing the Mn 3 O 4 phase, but on annealing you see a small shift there therefore, something should be happening only at the interface not in the bulk and what happens at the interface will tell us what sort of um, evolution is happening uh, with the phase. Now, if you look at the RBS pattern this is RBS spectra nothing but Rutherford backscattering spectrum and this is called a channeling experiment which will tell us whether in a zinc oxide crystal if there is any impurity is doped whether that would give a good channel or a um, disturbed channel. If the channeling value is good then you say that there is clear doping if a secondary phase is uh, forming then the channeling will be very bad which means you are not able to uh, grow a epitaxial layer. So, you can get variety of information from Rutherford backscattering. So, this is the situation for a ZnO layer and then which is capped with the Mn 3 O 4 layer. So, this is as grown you have alumina then you put uh, a thick ZnO and then on the top you put Mn 3 O 4. Now, channeling uh, profile will be something like this the dotted one here is the simulated spectrum for 2 percent manganese oxide doped ZnO the simulated spectrum has to be something like this. But what you see here for a as grown film this is the one which is uh, showing that there is a substantial decrease in zinc because you have Mn 3 O 4 on the top. But as you anneal the sample you can see here that suddenly there is a camel back that is uh, coming and that camel back is actually due, due to Mn 3 O 4. So, what really happens between the as grown film and the annealed film you can see here as it is uh, given in this cartoon the some of the zinc oxide zinc 2 plus ions are actually diffusing into the Mn 3 O 4 layer and they are getting substituted in the interstitial sites there are vacancies oxygens are also lost and zinc is getting incorporated here and there in the Mn 3 O 4 matrix. This is the signature that we can get from Rutherford backscattering. Now, what would happen if you take uh, such a film and then you heat it 
the, this film is nothing but a representation of uh, this configuration. So, you actually have uh, sapphire and then you have the zinc oxide and then over that you have manganese 3 O 4 layer. So, if you try to take uh, a VSM loop you can see here with more and more of annealing temperature the ferromagnetic loop is developing. So, this could actually happen at the interface because of a inter diffusion across the layers rather than substitution. So, more and more of zinc seemingly is getting incorporated into the lattice and as a, uh, into the MN 304 lattice as a result you see the magnetic moment is picking up incidentally this signature is comparable to what is reported. So, instead of a reverse engineering that is zinc uh, manganese getting doped into zinc we seem to see zinc getting uh, dispersed into the MN 304 matrix forming a secondary phase which is responsible for such a magnetic phase. Now, you can try to uh, uh, reconfirm this by growing zinc oxide on MN 304 instead of growing MN 304 layer like this on uh, ZNO we try to grow ZNO on MN 304. Now, if you try to do the channeling studies as you can see here this is the as grown um, signature uh, for ZNO on MN 304 which means there is considerable amount of zinc. Now, if you try to anneal this compound for 9 hours you can see considerably the zinc proportion is going down. What does it mean? There it is not the reverse transport that is manganese going into zinc oxide it is the zinc which is diffusing into the manganese oxide layer. So, this is a very handy proof and to support this um, <coughs> this group also went about doing another experiment. What did they do here? Again they took uh, uh, alumina substrate and uh, over this alumina substrate they just deposited 2 percent zinc oxide incorporated MN 304. Take MN 304, take MN 304 and make it as a hard pellet so that you can grow films and in this MN 304 pellet you try to dope 2 percent zinc. Now, if you deposit such a film this is what is the x-ray pattern. What does it show? You, sh you clearly see signature for MN 203, you see signature for MN 203, again you see signature for MN 203 here along with MN 203 you also see signature for MN 304 and you also see signature for MN 304 and now this film clearly shows there is a magnetic signal at 300 K. Magnetic signal is clear at room temperature which gives us a clue that zinc can also diffuse into MN 304 and it is not the manganese which is diffusing into uh, ZNO. Now, if you try to m monitor what is exactly the mechanism this is for a x is equal to 2 percent zinc that is doped at 400 millitor. Suppose for the same zinc composition if I try to deposit at 100 millitor instead of 400 millitor of oxygen pressure. Now, you can see here I am not able to observe any MN 203 here there is no MN 203 there is no MN 203 here there is no MN 203 here and there is no MN 203 here when I deposit this films at 100 millitor that is at low uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Now, I can twist this uh, again instead of uh, keeping same 400 millitor I can try to substitute now 4 percent of zinc. Now, if I try to increase zinc concentration at 400 millitor again I am seeing a nice magnetic loop this is a room temperature signal. So, 2 percent or 4 percent zinc at 400 millitor of oxygen partial pressure I am getting a film which is ferromagnetic. 
Now, the same 4 percent if I try to do at 2 percent I am losing the ferromagnetic signal. Now, keep the um, 400 millitor constant and then try to substitute with 10 percent of zinc. Again you would see Mn 2 O 3 is not there. When Mn 2 O 3 is not there then you can clearly see that there is no ferromagnetism. Now, when you do it at low partial pressure you again see there is no ferromagnetism. So, two things are happening higher than 4 percent Z n there is no ferromagnetism and less than 100 millitor of oxygen again there is no ferromagnetism. So, two things are clearly proving that there is something happening between the zinc that is getting diffused into the manganese 3 uh, o, uh, Mn 3 O 4 layer rather than Mn getting diffused into Z n O. So, this clearly proves that it is it is the 2 percent zinc oxide that is getting into M N 3 O 4 phase as a result it is the M N 2 minus x Z n x O 3 minus delta which is responsible for ferromagnetism. So, whenever there is lack of M N 2 O 3 then there is no ferromagnetism M N 3 O 4 is not affected M N 2 O 3 seems to be the clue and when M N 2 O 3 is always present you see there is a clear ferromagnetic loop coming. So, this group went about to propose that it is not zinc that is doped into uh, sorry this is not manganese that is doped into Z n O rather it is a, a defect induced concentration in M n 2 minus x Z n x O 3 minus delta which is actually stabilizing a ferromagnetic signal above room temperature. Now, this is a very classic example to show that the characterization techniques that we employ can be both useful and it can be risky. Because blindly when you look at a magnetic signature if anything that is coming that cannot substantiate that it is a true property of a material. Especially when you are trying to dope uh, impurities of the order of 2 percent or 4 percent one has to be extremely careful to see what is the exact mechanism that underlies the magnetic property. Now, the sort of characterization tools like RBS or thin film whatever uh, thin film based uh, studies these are all very costly it is not possible always for all the groups to afford such exclusive techniques to elucidate whether uh, the physical properties are going with the structure. But at the same time I have told uh, uh, I have shown you in the previous slides how simple techniques like thermogravimetry can also be very handy to substantiate this viewpoint. So, in the next few slides I am going to show to you from a chemistry point of view we can try to understand how the whole thing can be understood. Uh, in fact, uh, the understanding of magnetism now is clear, but from the chemist point of view I, I would like to throw different routes by which we can prepare and yet we can draw very conclusive evidence whether manganese is really getting doped or not in bulk or in thin film form. So, for this reason I have uh, chosen um, four techniques that one can employ to study one single property that is manganese doped Z n O 2 Z n O and we can employ the simple solid state synthesis for comparison already I have shown you some of the results from the other group. We can try to make a thin film out of pulse electron de deposition or we can use microwave coupled polyol route which I would be also discussing this example in module 6 when we talk about optical properties in solids and I will also show you another uh, example of microwave combustion route all this the, um, the physical picture or the mechanistic uh, understanding about 
these preparation routes I have already discussed in the first module, but nevertheless I will use these four techniques to show how this can be understood from a chemist point of view. Let us take the case of manganese doped zinc oxide prepared by uh, solid state synthesis and here if you look at the <coughs> x-ray pattern you can clearly see that all the x-ray patterns are looking very clean whether you dope uh, with 2 percent or 4 percent it gives a convincingly clear x-ray pattern. Now as we already saw that log intensity plots are very very important than seeing the linear intensity plot as you would see this is a linear intensity plot and this is a log intensity plot of the same pattern and you can see although this looks noisy this will give you clear uh, evidence whether any impurities are hiding here. So, it is always careful for people working on bulk to probe the log intensity plot of x-ray than to simply be gratified by a linear intensity plot and all these plots what you see here on the left side and right side is, is the same plot, but plotted in different scale. So, you can clearly see there is no evidence of any um, secondary phase coming here, but what can we say? Now, if you try to look at ESR spectra, ESR spectra clearly gives you clue about whether it is M n 2 plus or not. In fact, M n 2 plus is possible, doping M n 2 plus in solid state method is possible, but the ESR spectra does not give a clue that these are isolated M n 2 plus core which is sitting in Z n O matrix. Why? Because if it is a isolated if it is a isolated M n 2 plus then the ESR signal has to be a 6 line it should be a 6 line spectra, but what we see here is a gross broad ESR spectra showing that there is a cumulative effect or there is manganese manganese interaction in the Z n O. It may be substituted, but these manganese are not isolated as a result you do not get the splitting 6 line spectra rather you are getting a broad spectra. So, there is a limitation in the solid state feature that you are effectively able to grow um, or substitute manganese yet the compound suffers from manganese manganese interaction therefore, the magnetic property is limited by this M n 2 plus 2 plus interaction that is what you exactly see because you clearly see that your Z n O bulk is uh, non magnetic and it does not show any loop, but with increasing concentration of manganese from 2 percent to 4 to 10 percent you clearly see that the moment is increasing. So, this magnetic property is actually coming from M n M n interaction rather than coming from a pure doped situation. We will see other examples in the next few slides. In the same sample we can also get clue whether manganese is really do getting doped. If we take the photoluminescent spectra of manganese doped in zinc oxide you can clearly see that this is the peak for undoped Z n O powder uh, which is synthesized by solid state all we can see here is it is a defect induced P L emission uh, that is characteristic of this 550 broad peak. If it is really band to band edge as uh, I have discussed earlier in the other lectures the band to band edge should actually come here at 380. But one thing we can uh, be clear that when manganese is getting doped you can clearly see that this surface or defect induced emission is suppressed and the band to band edge emission is getting favored. Although still there is considerable defects one can say that manganese is getting substituted in some form, but not necessarily to affect the magnetic property, but there is a corporate effect and manganese seems to be suppressing the oxygen uh, deficiency because manganese is able to bring in uh, oxygen uh, while zinc is actually losing oxygen in the lattice. So, this is uh, <coughs> one of the 
uh, view point from the solid state uh, prepared sample. Now, let us go to same manganese 2 percent or 4 percent doped uh, zinc oxide uh, uh, system, but this time instead of solid state we will use pulse electron deposition because pulse electron deposition is also complementary to PLD as I have already discussed in module 2. So, this is a simple uh, setup of uh, PED which we can use for making such uh, samples and look at the x-ray pattern of this uh, uh, manganese doped zinc oxide films. Uh, these are the uh, zinc oxide films which is plotted in log intensity and the same films uh, which are deposited on quartz plate in this case. Uh, if you grow this zinc oxide you can clearly see they show very clean feature and you would not expect any sort of manganese impurity in, in this uh, ZNO films. Therefore, one can clearly walk out uh, walk away with uh, the understanding that manganese is getting doped and in this case you can also see that you can dope even 10 percent of manganese without any trace impurity for uh, manganese here. So, having said that uh, look at the uh, <coughs> microstructure this is how the ZNO films are uh, when you uh, deposit using PED. Now, this is for the 2 percent uh, manganese this is for 4 percent manganese and when you go to 10 percent you do not see the same sort of a feature there is something else happening therefore, compositionally it may be 10 percent doped sample but there could be something else happening. So, it need not necessarily be a doped zinc oxide film. So, let us look at the PL spectra and the ESR spectra as you would see here compared to the solid state uh, uh, <coughs> grown films uh, you still see a very nice uh, 380 nanometer peak for uh, manganese doped ones and here again the same story as that of solid state where you see the zinc oxide uh, shows a very uh, low uh, 380 nanometer peak mainly because it is losing much on the defect induced concentration whereas, manganese dope ones are suppressing the uh, 550 nanometer uh, peak, but it is showing the 380 nanometer peak. And when you go to the ESR spectra for 2 percent or 4 percent peak and th this is what the cartoon says that there is no signature of isolated M n 2 plus signal rather see a very broad signal and this broad signal is uh, suggesting that M n 2 plus are having some sort of clustering. If it is M n M n interaction then you would expect something like this and there is also another signature here which is typical for M n 3 O 4 phase which although you do not see in the bulk form, but yet you see there is a clear signal for something other than M n 2 plus there is a signal it could actually come from M n 3 plus or M n 4 plus concentration. <coughs> so, this is the situation if you try to look at the uh, PED grown thin films. Now, what is more convincing when you look at it is the magnetic property unless you see a uh, unlike uh, the other case where you see a faint magnetic signature if you uh, <coughs> grow PED uh, grown films then you can see for 2 to 10 percent you can clearly see the signal changing. For 2 percent you see a negative slope this is coming mainly because you are using a quartz plate and therefore, the diamagnetic contribution is more. So, you can actually do a diamagnetically corrected compound and in that case a clear uh, <coughs> loop is found this is at room temperature. Now, if you increase the concentration you see the green curve and then the blue curve which on diamagnetic correction shows a clear loop. So, if you do not probe into ESR and just look at the x-ray and then the magnetic property you can clearly say that I have doped manganese because there is a monotonic increase in the magnetic moment with respect to substitution therefore, you would clearly convince yourself that it is a manganese doped zinc oxide film, but this need not be mainly because we see that these are not isolated manganese in the ZNO matrix. So, ESR in this situation comes out very handy. Now, let us go uh, to microwave combustion synthesis 
microwave combustion synthesis is like a brute force method because you are providing enough of uh, uh, <coughs> flame temperature in this reaction for the reaction to occur therefore, you can quickly dope manganese into ZNO lattice not only that it is a fast quenching reaction as I discussed already in the first module. So, you are actually using a rapid synthesis and a fast quenching method therefore, you can stabilize metastable phase. For example, if manganese can clearly be doped at high temperature then you can suddenly cool it and stabilize the metastable phase and look at the x-ray pattern you can clearly see the ZNO uh, peak and the microwave combustion stuff, but what is interesting here to find is that at 10 percent you can clearly see another feature that is coming close to the ZNO peak. And if you plot the whole thing in log intensity plot you can see this impurity much more pronounced even at 4 percent you can see the signature there. Therefore, it is very very important for us to carefully look at the signature that is coming out. Uh, note for example, these are all the signatures for MNO which is coming out of the zinc oxide lattice. So, microwave combustion seemingly is able to dope manganese, but there is also a residual uh, impurity that is seen and the PL uh, spectra is completely plagued with uh, defect concentration therefore, you do not see any band to band emission uh, edge emission, but you see uh, defect induced uh, or oxygen deficient uh, uh, PL uh <coughs> behavior. Now, if you take the ESR spectra of this manganese doped uh, compounds uh, prepared by microwave combustion route you see that you can uh, you do not exactly see a 6 line spectra, but you are seeing a 16 line spectra and this 16 line spectra suggests that this is not exactly M n 2 plus, but these are signatures for both M n 3 and M n 4 plus concentration. It is for 2 percent, it is for 4 percent, it is for 10 percent therefore, one can clearly say that in microwave combustion what is happening is the M n 2 plus is also getting converted to higher oxidation states which are M n 3 plus and M n 4 plus and therefore, it is very very important that we try to look at the ESR spectra when you are specially studying the manganese system. <coughs> look at the uh, uh, magnetic uh, signatures as seen here ZNO is clearly giving a negative uh, slope. So, there is no problem the moment you put 2 percent it is turning positive and then for 4 percent and then for 10 percent you can clearly see a loop. Therefore, it gives a very convincing signature that it is indeed a doped situation, but actually what we see here is it is not just manganese doping it is something more than that you seem to end up with different oxidation states of manganese. So, uh, a rapid combustion route clearly gives evidence for something other than manganese 2 plus which is present in the ZNO lattice. Now, let us go to another soft route this is not a rapid route like uh, thin film or um, the microwave combustion route this is a kinetically controlled one which I have already discussed in the first module again on microwave polyol synthesis. Now, look at the x-ray pattern here again it is very clear that you have a clean phase there is nothing there, but you, you can see it is bit noisy there are some small peaks which are emerging here when you do this plot in log intensity. So, in log intensity plot you see there are some disturbing or mild impurity features propping up for 4 percent and 10 percent peak, but seemingly the uh, undoped ones are very clear. So, with this uh, in view we can try to see what is exactly happening as I have told you earlier that you can do this using microwave polyol which is uh, the chamber that is used here. And if you take the ESR spectra of this uh, manganese oxide um, powders you can see that uh, there are interesting features coming up. For 2 percent and 4 percent doped manganese oxide you clearly see a 6 line spectra if you uh, amplify this you clearly see that this is a 6 line spectra and this is another 6 line spectra for 
uh, your manganese score, but the moment you go to higher percentage you see a very broad peak. What does this mean? In a soft route, soft chemical route which is kinetically controlled not thermodynamically controlled you can essentially dope manganese in a better way. There is a definite way that you can dope manganese into zinc oxide it is not impossible and that is seen from a 6 line spectra. Now having said that look at the PL, PL seems to be also again a defect induced uh, PL emission. So, with this in background if we look at the magnetic property you see again there is a clear evidence for substitution for zinc oxide there is a clear loop coming whereas the loops are showing a hysteresis but then it is not as clear like the way the PED uh, films are made or the microwave combustion route prepared samples. So, if you look at the mm, magnetic property you can clearly say that even though I have a clear evidence for manganese substitution in zinc oxide, but the magnetic property is not convincing because when there is manganese manganese interaction and a broad zinc oxide spectra the magnetic uh, feature is nearly com in comparison, but when you have a 6 line spectra in all those cases you still see a diamagnetic contribution more pronounced. Therefore, we need to be very cautious to say whether manganese is clearly doped or not. If it is clearly doped we do not see a strong magnetic feature as we have seen in other cases, but when there is a manganese manganese interaction then you again see something as what is reported. Now, if you look at the SEM features also you can clearly see that 2 percent and 4 percent manganese are clearly substituted in zinc oxide. For example, you take a macroscopic view of this 50 micron region you can take this uh, this is another view graph of 50 micron region. If you try to blow up any sort of um, regions you can see these are all nanopods of zinc oxide you do not see any secondary phase whether in backscattered or secondary electron image you do not see any secondary phase in this compound. So, we can clearly say that ma manganese is doped. Whereas, if you take 4 percent you see almost the same feature and you do not seem to see any uh, secondary phase that is prominently seen. So, you can have a variety of view graphs for that. Now, go to 10 percent doped one you can see there are regions which are significantly different from these regions. That means, when you go to higher percentage of manganese there can be chances for two different things to happen you know you can have both manganese uh, doped one as well as manganese segregated one and this is what we see from the x-ray also that some impurity peaks keep uh, propping up above 10 percent. So, what do we take uh, lesson from here uh, of all the uh, techniques that we have adopted to prepare this manganese doped zinc oxide. The most favored one where we can be clearly sure that 2 percent or 4 percent is exactly getting substituted we can go for the polyol route. Polyol route is the best for low doping concentration, but what happens the magnetic property is not convincing. Whereas, in the other cases where we have seen clear evidence for other phases of manganese you get very arresting magnetic signature. For example, in the case of microwave combustion route we get signature for valences other than M and 2 plus and in solid state synthesis I have shown you that the magnetic property is very convincing, but then we, we see this as a case where M and uh, M and O phase other, other phases are segregating and same way in PED films you can clearly dope manganese, but the <coughs> the mechanism of manganese doping does not seem to be clear although the magnetic features are same. So, I have shown you one is a milder approach one, one is a brute force approach 
one is a thin film approach one is the conventional solid state approach we need to be extremely careful because each of this preparatory features seemingly throws a variety of magnetic information. So, this is a very candid uh, study uh, by which we can try to incorporate as many characterization techniques as possible to understand the physical properties. Therefore, it is um, important uh, for every chemist or physicist or anyone in this field who is trying to look at the physical property to look more carefully into the structural property. So, structure property correlation is very important and we will see in the next slides other case studies where we can use multi characterization techniques to elucidate the structure and correlate with the properties.